Hello, History 1 students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have notes for Chapter 12, Section 2, Railroads. So, your first main idea. After the Civil War, railroad construction expanded dramatically. In number one, the railroad boom began in 1862 when President Lincoln signed what was known as the Pacific Railroad Act. Uh, this act, for the most part, brought about the beginning of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, it had the Union Pacific and also the Central Pacific that would come together and merge into one railway. Kind of leading up to this, uh, if you go back to about the 1860s, the United States only had about 35,000 miles of rails in this country. But as this act and others will be passed and railroads completed, by 1900, we're going to have over 200,000 miles of railroad track in the United States. Number two, the Central Pacific Railroad had primary investors who were known as the Big Four. And the Big Four consisted of Charlie Crocker, um, Collis Huntington, Mark Hopkins, and probably most famous, a guy named Leland Stanford. Stanford would go on to become the governor of California, but he's probably more noted for Stanford University. Number three, because of the shortage of labor in California, about 10,000 workers from China were hired to work on the Central Pacific Railway. Just so you know, uh, Union Pacific, under the leadership of Granville Dodge, um, began construction of its portion of the Transcontinental Railroad out of Omaha, Nebraska. It had about 10,000 workers, but a lot of them were immigrants, primarily Irish uh, laborers who were working on the railways. Uh, when we talk about uh, the workers out of China, many of these men were working for very, very low wages. Uh, they were taking on very dangerous tasks, uh, such as um, basically using uh, dynamite and other explosives to move some of the rubble. But needless to say, they were able to get a lot of the job done. Um, when we talk about the railway, uh, on May 10th, 1869, the last spike of the Transcontinental Railroad was actually um, put in at a place called Promontory Summit in Utah. And it's at that spot where five golden and silver spikes are going to be put into uh, the tracks. The last spike was actually wired to a telegraph. And it actually was kind of like a kind of like a Twitter message. When somebody tweets, uh, that message would go throughout the world. And in a sense, uh, this was to mark the completion of uh, the railway. When we talk about uh, the miles of track, that were offered up. The Central Pacific, they laid about 688 miles of track, whereas the Union Pacific laid over 1,800 or 1,086 uh, miles of track throughout the United States. All right, your next main idea. The expansion of the railway spurred American industrial growth. Uh, number four, railroad companies stimulated the economy by spending money on things like steel, coal, timber, and other necessities. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, our railways were big consumers of goods. You know, to build railroads, you need lots and lots of steel. Uh, if you think about it, uh, for every mile of track, that's going to be laid down. You need at least 400 rails for one mile. And each rail required at least 10 spikes. So that's a lot of, a lot of metal going into just putting down the, the railway, let alone talking about the cars and other locomotives that are going to be running on these rails. And the fuel that you need, uh, things like coal and even timber, timber not only for the rails, but also uh, to keep the, the trains going. So needless to say, uh, our railroads were really a big uh, help to our bustling economy at this period of time. Number five, railroad consolidation resulted in seven giant systems that were controlled 
uh, that controlled most of the rail traffic in the eastern part of the United States. One of the most notorious uh, of consolidators was a guy named Vanderbilt, and it should probably read Cornelius uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, in 1869, he purchased and merged three really short line rails in New York. And by 1870, he had extended these lines all the way out to Chicago. In 1871, he also began the construction on the iconic side of New York City's Grand Central Station. So needless to say, Vanderbilt was a very, very wealthy man. Number six, before the 1880s, each community set its clock by the sun's position at noon. You know, the American Railway Association was this organization that really wanted to push for standardized time zones. And eventually uh, they were able to get that to happen. Part of that being the fact that uh, if you wanted to help consumers know when the trains were coming in, if you had a consistent time uh, that could be used throughout the United States or within a region, it made it a lot easier to, to inform people when the train would actually be arriving. So number seven, to make rail save, service safer and more reliable, uh, the American Railway Association divided the country into four time zones, Eastern time zone, Central time zone, Mountain time zone, and Pacific time zone. And for the most part, this was done in 1883, and we're still kind of living with parts of this today. Certain states, especially uh, states like Indiana, which are kind of like between the central and the eastern time zone, actually have counties that opt in for things like daylight savings time. All right, number eight, and the main idea. Uh, to encourage railroad construction, the federal government gave land grants to many railroad companies. Uh, the Union Pacific certainly uh, was probably more famous for a lot of the, the territory and, and land grants that it received. Uh, but there were other land grants given during the 1850s and 60s. And one of the things that was happening is there was about 120 million acres of land uh, that eventually uh, the federal government had given away to the railroad companies. Uh, this is kind of the equivalent of what would be like our New England states. So if you combined um, Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut plus uh, New York State and Pennsylvania, put them all together, and that's about the equivalent of the, the land that the federal government had kind of sold off or given away uh, to these railroad companies. Uh, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railroads, when they were working on the transcontinental line, actually had received enough land grants to really cover the cost of construction. Your next main idea, the great wealth many railroad entrepreneurs acquired in the late 1800s led to acquisitions that they had built their fortunes through dishonest means. Jay Gold, who was a railroad owner, was infamous for manipulating stocks and being very corrupt. Uh, he had actually swindled investors and taxpayers and actually bribed uh, government officials, uh, cheating them on contracts and debts. And uh, many people started to think that maybe the railroad companies were not all that honest. Um, railroads had bribed members of Congress to acquire some of these land grants. And what's going to eventually happen is a, a probably a very notorious scandal that has roots here in this part of the country uh, known as the Credit Mobilier. Um, the Credit Mobilier scandal uh, kind of goes like this. Credit Mobilier was actually the construction company set up uh, by the Union Pacific shareholders. And it was under uh, the guise of a guy named Oakes Ames, uh, who happened to be a member of Congress. Uh, acting for Union Pacific and Credit Mobilier, the investors signed contracts with themselves. In other words, they're, they're charging these companies and they're kind of going to reap the profits. And what ends up happening is um, the railroad companies have to pay these things, but the investors are the ones who are really profiting. 
And what ends up happening is Union Pacific actually was kind of forced to pay inflated bills without making any questions of it, uh, where some of our politicians were going to make a lot of money off of it. So anyway, when Union Pacific Railroad was completed, a lot of these investors had made millions of dollars, but the railroad had pretty much used up a good portion of its federal grants that they had received. And Union Pacific was almost bankrupt. So to convince members of Congress to kind of give the railroads more grants, uh, Oaks Ames, for the most part, sold other members of Congress shares of Union Pacific at very low discounted prices. And what ends up happening is as we move into the election of 1872, the scandal kind of kind of hits the, the newspapers. And eventually the New York Sun lists many of the members of Congress that had accepted bribes. And this would include Speaker of the House James Blaine, uh, soon to be President James Garfield, and the current serving uh, Vice President under Grant, a guy named Skyler Colfax. What's interesting is when this scandal all blows over, there are no criminal or civil charges that are going to be filed, even though it was probably one of the most corrupt scandals in railroad history. All right. Thank you very much.